I know we have some big kids today because I know the littler kids are uh, at children's uh, church. So, but I thought I'd keep uh, with the tradition that Pastor Dave has started. So we're starting out with a kids quiz, um, and so uh, we're gonna we're gonna try this out. I've never done this before, but. Uh, Here we go. Okay. Question. Who wrestled with God? Was it Samson, Jacob, Goliath, David, or Luke? Can I see a hand? It was Jacob. Yes, right. It was Jacob. Way to go. All right. Next question. Jacob, as a result of wrestling with God, got a new name. What was I? What was it? Was it Jedi, Obadiah, Isaac, or Israel? Hannah. Israel, yes. It was Israel. All right. Who was blinded by a bright light as they traveled to Damascus? All right, here we go. Was it Saul? It was Saul. Yes, good job. It was Saul. All right. Who was sent to visit Saul in Damascus? Was it Abimelech, Anna, Ananias, or Alexia? Ananias, that's right. Man, you guys are smart. You're good. Okay, here's a little trickier one, maybe. What fell from Saul's eyes? Something like rocks, something like lashes, something like scales, or something like contact lenses? Yes. Something like scales, correct. Very good. So thank you for participating. All these things did have, that do have something into what I'm going to talk about today. So, uh, astonished. We're going to talk about being astonished. Uh, before we do, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Our Father, uh, God, we come before your throne just giving you thanks, Father, for your just goodness. Um, and Lord, you are worthy of our praise and our adoration this morning. We invite your presence here this morning. We invite your Holy Spirit to be with us and to fill this place and to fill our hearts. And Father, you know our hopes. You know, you know that you have plans for us. Father, and this morning you know our needs. And so, Lord, we just anticipate uh, your blessing with us today. We cling to you this morning and just uh, pray that uh, you would bless us as you bless Jacob. Um, and Father, just may these not be my words, but may they be your words. For I pray it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. So uh, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary defines astonished as to strike with sudden and unusually usually great wonder or surprise. Those, you know. Um, so have you ever, has your world ever been turned upside down? Uh, have you ever been astonished, filled with wonder or surprise? Or has anyone ever said something to you that caused you to be surprised? Has anybody said something about you? that you thought, wow, that's surprising. Yes? Yeah. And were you surprised and astonished? <laughs> yes. Um, there is a quote um, from uh, Mark Twain. He said, I can live for two months on a good compliment. Yeah. Ralph Waldo Emerson said that our chief want is someone who will inspire us to be what we could be. These two quotes uh, are going to be uh, significant in terms of what we will be talking about. But God is amazing. Uh, God's Word is amazing. Um, and to me, when I read God's Word, it is astonishing. Whoa. Oh, oh, oh. Needs to go. Yeah, there you go. Just go to, you can yeah, don't don't touch. <laughs> don't touch. Sorry about that. Um, but today I'm gonna we're gonna be talking and we're gonna we're gonna start with the story of Saul. 
on the road to Damascus. And we're going to talk about Jacob. And these two stories, while they might not seem that they're connected, um, we're going to make some connection with. Um, and I love studying God's Word because, young people, God's Word, it, there's such a depth and profundity. Even though I spoke about Saul not too long ago, I think the last time we were here, we talked about Saul and, and just how words, that, when the name is repeated, it has a, it has a meaning. There's such a depth to God's Word, just kind of getting into it. Um, over and over, I always learn something new, and to me, that's astonishing. Every time I read it, I learn something new, and to me, that's astonishing, and it's refreshing. And so I'm really excited to share with you today um, because, uh, you know, I, I, just, I was just astonished of something that I had not seen before. Maybe it was there. Maybe, you know, you've always seen it, but for me, it was like new, and, and it's transformative. It was something that just kind of changed the way that I'm beginning to look at um, my relationship with God and then how I relate, specifically how I relate to others. So if you have your Bibles with you or your uh, phones, uh, I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 9. We're going to be reading Acts chapter 9 and going through uh, the conversion of Saul. So Acts chapter 9 verses 1 through 6, we will start there. And it says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Saul's belief and his picture of God that he had was one that he thought that God would be happy with what he was doing, that God approved of him going and bringing people bound against their wills. The kind of picture that Saul had at this time of God was a picture of God that was judgmental, a God that was exacting in character. His picture of God was something that did not please God. What he was doing was not something that was pleasant to God. He thought that God was exclusive. He thought that God was only for a certain people, and they had to do things a certain way. What else can we say about Saul, who is that he was very passionate. He was so passionate that he was willing to take these people by force. He was a zealous man. Saul was also a well-connected person, because obviously he had you know, the high priest that he went to, uh, and he had this opportunity, so he was well connected. Saul was very persistent in his zeal to persecute the early church. And while thinking he was doing God's will, uh, in the encounter, we see that Paul, Saul experiences something different. Uh, he experiences this presence of God, which theologians call a theophany. Basically, Moses you know, was the burning bush, but for Saul here was this bright light that he, that he experiences. And he falls to the ground. And there, as the light is all around him, he hears this voice. And notice that it's a voice that he does not recognize. He does not know who it is. He does not recognize this voice. All he hears is, Saul, Saul. And as many of you were here when I preached uh, that time about uh, this example of Saul, whenever you hear the name mentioned twice, Saul, Saul, it represents that uh, the Lord... Uh, is not happy. This motif is one where this person is about to make a major misunderstanding and a major misconception of the nature and reality and the character of God. We saw it with Martha, Martha. Remember when um, Martha was, went to Jesus and said, you know, you know, get my sister to help me. And, and, and Jesus said, Martha, Martha, your sister had chosen the, base thing, the, the good thing by sitting here with me. Or when he said, Simon, Simon, after Simon said, I will go to you even to the death, Jesus said, Simon, Simon. Whenever you hear these two words, it's because somebody's about to make a big mistake. Somebody has a misconception of the character of God. So this is why the repetition, Saul, Saul. So when we hear Saul, Saul, it is no coincidence. He's got letters. He's going to the high priest to detain people that are out of the way. Saul believes in his heart that he is doing God's will. And by the way, believing that you're on God's side doesn't mean that you are on God's side. 
It just simply means that you think you're on God's side. The reality was that God is not all that pleased with Saul's seal and persecution of the church. And he's forcing people to do things against their will. So in verse 5, he continues and he says, Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? He doesn't recognize the voice. Saul doesn't know who he is. And in fact, the next three words that Saul hears is something that's going to totally astonish and shock Saul. He said, then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Saul was not expecting this. He was trembling. He was astonished. He, he was shaken. He was shaken to his core. His whole world had been turned upside down. Everything that he had worked for, everything that he had thought has just been totally um, changed. He thought he was protecting the traditions of, 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 of his fathers. He thought he was preserving the Jewish uh, religion. He thought he was saving them from these heretics who started, you know, who were talking about a Messiah that had already come. He, his whole world was changed. He was so dr drastic. And then the Lord said to him, continuing on, he says, And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. They were also astonished. They, saw, they, saw, they heard something, but they didn't see anybody speaking. They couldn't see anyone. They were so astonished that they were speechless. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. He couldn't see, but, he, but they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. Not only was Saul astonished, but his traveling companions were astonished. They were speechless. And Luke gives us here in this story some additional details that I think are interesting. He tells us that for three days, Saul did not eat or drink. Just kind of mentions that. Saul did not eat or drink. Have you ever had that experience where you were just did not want to eat or drink? You didn't want to do any of that? To me, that sounds like depression. He was so depressed. He didn't want to eat. He didn't want to drink. He didn't want to have anything. Saul's world was totally turned upside down. And so here he is. He is taken. He's led away. He, by his friends, by the hand, he can't see a thing. And, and I just started to imagine, what is going through, through Saul's head right now? What, what is his experience right now? What, what is going through his head? He goes, they take him in, and you know, the first day say, Saul, okay, you can't see, but here, Saul, here's some food. Why don't you have something to eat? No, don't want to eat. Go away. Saul, you should drink some water. No, I don't want to drink any water. Just leave me alone. Saul, please, you got to eat. You can't just eat. I don't want to eat. Saul was depressed. Saul wanted to die. The second day, Saul, you have to eat something. Here, we brought you something to eat. Go away. Leave me alone. I don't want to eat. Well, at least drink some water. No, I don't want to drink any water. Two days. Nothing. He wouldn't drink. Just leave me alone. I'm wondering what he's replaying in Saul's mind. We know the picture that Saul had of God, that God was this exacting God that would, would force somebody. And I'm wondering if he's, if he's thinking, okay, now I, I've done it, right? I've, now, now I have blindness, I can't see. What's next? What's next for me? What, what can, it, can it wait for me? I have been fighting against God. Now, you know, what, what can wait for me? So Saul just was despondent. He wanted to die. He thought that God was a vengeful God. His picture of God was forcing others to obedience. And now he's waiting his turn, waiting for the hand of oppression, waiting for a hand that will come upon him. He had participated and was an accomplice in the stoning of Stephen. I'm sure that that kind of came to his mind as well. What are the th some of the things that I've done to these people out of the way? Stephen, he died. He was stoned. I was there. I held the coats. 
Other people, I've broken up families. I took mothers, fathers, took them away from their kids. All these things playing in Saul's head. Things that he had done. He could not eat or drink for three days. Continuing on in verse 10, it says, Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, notice he only mentions his name once, and he said, here I am, Lord. He recognized who it was. And the Lord said, him, said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight and to the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Things, some of the things that just jump out at me is that the Lord here, Jesus, tells him he knows the street where he lives. He knows the house. You know, he knows the, the hairs on our heads. And for some of us, you know, he just knows us really well. He knows where we live. He knows the street that we live on. He knows our address. And he tells him to go and visit Saul so that he may regain his sight. But Ananias answered and said, Lord, I have heard many things about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he is, has authority from the chief priests to bind all who would call upon your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And Ananias was the disciple and Ananias was astonished. He said, are you, are you sure, uh, Saul? Have you heard about this guy? Have you, do you know the things that he's done? He has done many evil things in Jerusalem. Everybody knows why he's here to Damascus. I know he's come with letters from the, from the chief priest to, to arrest any of us who are following you. Are, are you sure, Lord? Notice God's response in his amazing and this is amazing and astonishing. God shares a vision of what Saul can become. God expresses his hope for Saul. God expresses his faith in Saul and what he can be as a chosen vessel. Many, like Saul, have mistaken the character of God. Many have not understood God's posture toward them. Saul is in a room and was thinking about judgment, expecting a, a hand of retaliation and a hand of jump, judgment thinking I've gone too far. There's no hope for me. Steeped in depression, he could not see a future. Perhaps his blindness was just the beginning. And may, many have mistaken the character of God. People easily blame God for all their problems. And when things don't go ex as expected, they assume they are being punished by God. I would like to look at another example for us this morning. Um, and it's the example of uh, Jacob wrestling with God. So turn with me to Genesis 32, uh, and it's the story of Jacob wrestling with God, um, verse 22 through 32. And it says, And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of Jacob, Jabbok. And he took them, sent them over the brook, and as he sent them over, uh, what he had with what, with what he had, so Jacob is preparing. He he's coming back to the land. He know he has deceived his brother Esau, so he's coming, and he knows he's going to meet him. And so he divides his family into two groups. He says, you know, in case you know my brother overtakes one of them, you know, he has one go one way and the other go a, a, a different way. Um, but as he's preparing here, um, he says goodbye to his family. He stays behind, and he is going to pray. It says in verse 24, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he could not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of, joint, of his joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. 
Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over, Peniel the sun rose on him, and he lived on his hip. You know, here Jacob was struggling with his sin, with his background, the things that he had done. And so he's alone and he's praying. And he's, he's there alone and he knows that he has to face the consequences of his actions. And as he's there, he has sent his family away. He feels a hand touch him. He immediately assumes that it is a hand of aggression. He immediately assumes that who is there to touch him, that is his brother Esau. And so immediately he begins to wrestle. He begins to wrestle. And I could just, in my vivid imagination, picture Jesus there with, with him. And he's like, okay, this is what you want to do? You want to wrestle? Okay, well, we'll wrestle. Um, and he wrestles with him. Wrestles with him all night. You know, I, I remember um, when uh, I have an older brother, uh, and a younger sister, but I remember wrestling with my younger sister, and, and obviously I was 10 years older than her, and so, you know, I would just kind of play, and I just, you know, and pretend like she would take me down or whatever, but I just, I just had that picture in my mind of just there, Jacob trying to wrestle with God, and God just saying, okay, well, if this is what you want to do, we'll, we'll go ahead and do this, till so eventually, hey, the uh, sun's coming up, and we're just going to do this to your hip, and oh, his leg, and he's like, oh, I can't move, and he just grabs onto him and he's like, oh, because he realizes, oh, he, he, he realizes who he's been wrestling. This is why I can't, haven't overpowered him. I've been wrestling with God. And so he clings to him. He holds on to him. And he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. I will not let you go until you bless me. He knows that God will bless him. But he's holding on. He's like, I will not let you go till you bless me. He had mistaken the hand that had come. Jesus comes to us. And when he, Jesus comes to us, he doesn't come as a hand of an adversary, but he comes as a friend. He comes to console. He came to console him, to let him know that everything was going to be okay. As a matter of fact, Spirit of Prophecy tells us that Esau had had a dream. And God had revealed to him all the things that Jacob had suffered, and he had softened his heart. But Jacob mistook the hand of God, had a misconception of the character of God, of who he was, and so he begins to wrestle because he thought it was a hand of oppression. So Jacob got a new name. He was persistent. He received a blessing, and his name was cha changed to Israel. Once we see God, we want to hold on to him. God's posture with Jacob was the same with Saul. His posture today for you and me is the same. His hand is stretched out to bless you, not to oppress or condemn. He bids us, come, if you are thirsty, come, let us reason together. So back to Saul. Saul is in his room. He doesn't want to eat. He hears footsteps coming walking through the room. And I wonder if he's expecting like uh, uh, like Jacob. He's expecting something. Oh, maybe this is it. I don't know. It's three days without food. Three days without drink. He's weak. He's tired. And what does he hear? So if you go back to Acts chapter 9 verse 17. It says, So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me, so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he arose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. What an amazing story. 
To me, it's amazing because it shows the power of community and it shows what God is, expects of us. We are to be like Ananias. That is our role to be like Ananias to Saul, to speak words of comfort. He addressed him as Brother Saul. He didn't say, hey, Saul, God talk, told me to be here. But he extends the hand of fellowship to him. He addresses him as brother. And he said, the same God who appeared to you has appeared to me. And so I'm here to regain, so you can regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So as Saul regains his sight, Saul, this story is astonishing because what God does, and this is what blows me away, God is kind of inefficient um, because when God appeared to Saul, why didn't God just tell Saul, Saul, here are my plans for you? He, he, he doesn't tell him that. He just says, go, you know, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll tell you what to do. He, God, God could have told him there. He could have said, Saul, I am the Lord Jesus who you've been persecuting. And so he tells him that, but then he could have told him, hey, I have plans for you. Here's what your, your future is going to look like. But he doesn't do it. It's kind of weird. He doesn't tell him that. He just waits. He doesn't tell him that. But he asks Ananias to do something. Jesus purposely tells Ananias, Ananias is the messenger to share with Saul the plans in the future that he has for him. It is Ananias who is tasked with sharing the vision of what Saul is to become. Brother Saul the laying of hands, this intimate connection. It is a posture of community and fellowship and friendship. It is not the hand of oppression and alienation, but the hand of fellowship. Not only, the, but it's an, it's an expression of a bright new future. Brother Saul, you're, you are chosen to hear the hate. Brother Saul, you are special. You are chosen to be chosen. You know, like, um, I remember like, uh, when I was in elementary school, I was kind of shorter, so I didn't kind of, I'm still kind of short, but I, I was really short. <laughs> and so like for kickball, you know, it's like you wanted to get picked, and I, I love playing sports, but I would, you know, I always get picked last, right? Uh, but I love to get, you know, you, we want to be chosen, but today we all know that we are all chosen. Just like Saul was chosen, we are all chosen as well. We have been chosen as well. And he said, brother, you are chosen. You are to preach to Gentiles and you are to preach to kings. You're going, you're going to preach to, you know, what you might consider the low, those that are not Jewish. But you're also going to preach to kings. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have you do that. And you're also going to preach to the children of Israel. And you are to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. I think when we read... 1 Corinthians chapter 13, what Paul later writes, it's because he writes it from experience when he talks about love. He has seen love reflected in his life. So love, chapter verses 4 and 7 of 1 Corinthians, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself, it's not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, it's not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And First John 4, 8, John reminds us that he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And if God is love, and we substitute God for love in that verse of First Corinthians, God suffers long, God does not envy, God does not parade itself. And we can say that he does not think no evil. He does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. God bears all things. God believes all things. God hopes all things. God endures all things. God is the biggest hoper. <laughs> is that a word? He's, he's somebody that hopes the most. He has hopes for us. And to me, that was kind of astonishing to, to realize that we are like Ananias. We are asked to speak a bright new future for someone else. 
We are to share a new identity with people. It's not what they're going through. It's kind of like the quotes I mentioned earlier. There is something about the words that we say to somebody that can have a huge impact in someone's life. We are to see it for them when they cannot see it for themselves. To put our hope in them. To see others and treat others with the potential that God sees in them. God has a filter that is a better than any Instagram or Snapchat filter that you can put on when you take a picture. God's filter is to see people for what He sees them for. See them through God's filter. The value that each of one has because the Son of God paid His life for them. The value that each one of us has for our, because He came and died for our salvation because each individual is unique. Each individual has incredible potential that no one else has. Sometimes it is easy to look at others and take notice of our differences. It is easy to look down on others who are not like us. It is easy to jump to conclusions about the potential of others or their standing, maybe the way they look or their tattoos or their piercings or whatever. We might look down on people. But that's not looking at them through the filter that God looks at us. There's a book that was written uh, called Balcony People. I don't know if any of you read it. It's from Joyce uh, Landorf uh, Heatherly. And she classifies people as two different types of people. She calls them balcony and basement. Basement people evaluate others with their critical judgments of people's words and actions. They tear away at others' souls. They make people feel like they are being compared to some unspoken ideal or some unspoken standard. Balcony people... On the other hand, affirm others. They cheer others on and energize them with their affirmations. They are genuinely interested in other people's lives and always believe the best about others. Whatever category you fall in, think about this. You have the power inside of you right now to take someone to a higher level, to not only make somebody's day, but to really transform somebody's life. There are people in your life that need you to believe in them. Maybe it's your spouse, your parent, your son, your daughter. Maybe it's a student. Maybe it's a teacher. Maybe it's your employees, your neighbor, or maybe even your boss. There are great stories that we, that we see. Um, it's kind of these archetype stories that we see about kind of the hero not believing in himself and in somebody, a coach or somebody believing in them and then they go and they do something. Have you seen those stories? You know, there, there's movies that, and they play on this kind of archetype theme where having, somebody having that belief in them and then they, they go on to be able to do things. They become the heroes. God's faith and belief in our potential is what we're asked to communicate to others. And to me, that's what kind of blew me away, is that God's plan for me is not only to share the message, but also to share a belief in those people, a belief in what they can be when they are connected with Christ. Um, now I will go to this quote. Yeah. So I read this quote, and I shared this with our um, young adult Sabbath school class because I was kind of just kind of blown away by these quotes, so I just kind of wanted to share them with you. Um, it says, uh, this is for Testimony of the Church, uh, Volume 6. It says, I have been instructed that the medical missionary work will discover in the very depths of degradation men who through they, though they have been given themselves up to intemperate, dissolute habits will respond to the right kind of labor. So she's talking to doctors, basically. She's talking to medical missionary people, people who deal with people that are sick. And she's basically saying, listen, you're going to meet people that, that are sick. Um, you're going to meet people that have abused their bodies. You're going to meet people that, have, uh, that are really broken down. And she says, um, but they need to be recognized and encouraged. Firm, patient, earnest efforts will be required in order to lift them up. Now notice this, they cannot restore themselves. They cannot restore themselves. They may hear Christ's call, but their ears are too dull to take in its meaning. Their eyes are too blind to see anything good in store for them. So it's not like you can just say, hey, I'm just going to tell you this. I'm telling you good news. 
No, they, they might not hear it. It's going to take persistent effort on our part. And it says, they are dead in trespasses and sins, yet even these are not to be excluded from the gospel feast. They are to receive the invitation, come, though they may feel unworthy. The Lord says, compel them to come in. Listen to no excuse. By love and kindness, lay the right hold of them. I read that and it was just like, wow, there are people who cannot see it. So we need to see it for them. There are people who are, who are, who are so caught up that they, they don't have the ability to do that. So that means that we have to create a vision for them. The next quote, um, this is uh, from Fundamentals of Christian Education. Um, and it's based on the subject of suspending of students. Uh, hopefully none of you uh, have been suspended. Um, but, but, she, but she says this, and this, to me this is powerful. She says, we live in a hard, unfeeling, uncharitable world. Is that true? Satan and his confederacy are plying every art to seduce the souls for whom Christ has given his precious life. Everyone who loves God in sincerity and truth will love the souls for whom Christ has died. If we wish to do good to souls, our success with these souls will be in proportion to their belief, in our belief, in an appreciation of them. Respect shown to the struggling human soul is the sure means through Christ Jesus of the restoration of the self-respect that man has lost. To me, that was so powerful to know that if we want to do good to the souls, our success is based on our, in the proportion of our belief in them. And to me, that was astonishing. That blew me away. In 1975, a young man who was struggling with what to do with his life returned home from college. One afternoon, he was hanging, up, uh, hanging out on his mother's beauty salon when a respected elderly woman came in to visit the shop. She, looked, she took her seat, saw the young man, and couldn't take her eyes off of him. Every time he looked in the mirror, he saw her behind looking at him. The woman saw something in that teenager, something he could not yet see for himself. Eventually, she spoke what was on her mind, and she said, the woman said, You know, young man, you're going to travel the world and speak to, and preach to millions of people. Then she wrote these words on a blue envelope and handed it to him. Her words spoke to his troubled heart. So he graciously accepted the envelope and signed it. Then he put it in his wallet so he would carry it with him. Today, Donzel Washington is one of the biggest movie stars in Hollywood. In an article published in February 2017, Don said that the woman's words really encouraged him when he was starting out as an actor, when he was at a low. The power of words, the power of a, of a vision. We are called to believe and see beautiful, bright, and expansive future for those who cannot see one for themselves. That is what Ananias did to Saul. That is what we are asked to do also. And that is why I'm astonished today. For me, it's kind of this game changer as I, as I kind of went through and read these quotes. And I pray that as you leave today, that maybe you would be astonished at the amount of God's grace, that he would give us the opportunity to do that. God could have told him, you know, Saul himself, but instead he entrusts us to do it. To me, that's amazing. We are his chosen vessels to distribute the good news of his kingdom. And we will win souls for his kingdom, not by persuasion of arguments, how right we are, but it's going to be by the love and belief that we have in their bright future with Jesus, whom is altogether lovely and faithful. It is my prayer this morning that you would go out this week and do the unexpected. Be a balcony person. Encourage somebody. Go out and astonish someone by saying words to them of affirmation or saying words to them of their a bright new future, an expansive future in Christ Jesus. Those words will bear fruit because some people need to hear it because they cannot see it for themselves.
<laughs> I forgot. It, um, used to do it a little, little different, but it's me to do the benediction. So let's uh, let's stand. Father, we um, marvel at your your grace. We marvel at your condescension to come to this world. Father, we just are astonished at the abilities that you have given us, the message that you have given us to go out and to share with others. Um, Father, we, we do it. We, we engage with others uh, to fellowship, to bring them into community, to bring them uh, into fellowship with you. Um, Help us, Father, take away the, the selfish heart that we have and give us hearts of flesh so that we could do the work that you want us to do. Uh, help us, Father, to speak words of encouragement to young people, speak words of encouragement to our family members, to encourage one another, and to see them, Lord, the way you see them. See them through your eyes. See them with the value that they have, the potential that you see in us. Lord, we just marvel at your grace and we just give you thanks. And we ask, Father, that you uh, bring us back safely next Sabbath. Pray that you be with our pastor. And pray that uh, you would be with everyone here today. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. All right. Happy Sabbath, everyone. And then we'll see you guys all for Fall Festival. <laughs>